Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. My dad was uh, an architect, and so he hooked us up, me and a couple of friends, my best friends, um, to work construction for a couple of summers. Uh, imagine uh, yeah, an 18, 19-year-old uh, with his best buddies, guys he'd grown up with, wielding uh, shovels and hammers, uh, power tools, driving trucks every now and then, and working with some of the roughest guys you'd ever meet in your life. Now, in that context, we were the college boys uh, who knew nothing about what they were doing, and they were trying to teach us. They kind of welcomed us in uh, reluctantly, um, but we learned so much. I worked alongside, no kidding, convicted felons uh, for a couple of summers and um, had an incredible time. I look back on that time as some of the most amazing moments in my life. Now, these guys looked at us as college kids wondering why in the world we would ever be going to college, you know, when summer came to an end. Um, now, we, we realized pretty quickly why we wanted to go to college. <laughs> but, you know, on the other hand, you know, why wouldn't you want to, you know, again, just, you know, drive tractors and trucks and build stuff, create things and work alongside other Men, and then you always get you know, snack time and lunch break and all that kind of stuff. Um, we called ourselves, uh, or they called us, I think, the chain gang, because we basically were doing the, the, you know, the, the menial work and, and really the hard labor. I mean, there was, we, were, we were filling up a giant hole almost half a summer. Um, we worked on a school one summer. I worked at a dorm room at, on a college campus. Uh, worked on a church um, in a sanctuary. And I remember, though, I have such fond memories. I could still get with, with these guys now. And we would laugh about stuff that happened. Um, you know, the time that David uh, Emery, one of my good friends, he thought he would try red man chewing tobacco for the first time. <laughs> and that didn't go well, you know. Um, and just, I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. And, uh, and I look back on those times with such fond memories. And now that I'm older, to be able to understand and kind of articulate what I probably couldn't at the time... Um, just this connection, this deep connection within me uh, between being a worker and, and being me, being human, where I was building something, I was a part of something. And, and yes, we, you know, and I have these fond memories, not because we got up at the crack of dawn, because we did. I, we jumped in the back of this pickup truck that would take us about a half an hour away one, one summer which was really a lot of fun when you're, again, 18, 19. Um, and we would work all day, I mean, hard out in the sun. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that part that we liked so much, but even that, you know, looking back and, and working with others and building something and getting a paycheck and, and sensing this, man, we, we did something, you know? And I can still go to that church today or even that dorm room or that school uh, and say, you know what? I built that. I had a part in that. And now I can say what I, I know is true when I look at Scripture, that there really is something to that. That God has created us to work. And so today we're going to talk about work. We're going to talk about the purpose of work. We're going to talk about the practice, what it is to work so as to glorify God. And then the ultimate prize of work. And while I do this, I want each one of you to think about your own work some of you work part-time, some of you work full-time, some of you, you're hating your job right now, some of you love your job, perhaps. Some of you love your job too much, perhaps. Some of you are in transition. I've already talked to one who's got a new job moving from Dallas to Phoenix. Uh, maybe your job is in the home. Listen, homemakers or moms or stay-at-home dads, perhaps. Listen, it might not be something you do, but someone you raise that would be the difference 
in, 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 in the lives of others. But even there, we don't find our ultimate worth and value in our kids. I'm talking about this often. We crush our children if we find our ultimate identity in them as a mom or as a dad. But whatever your work is, I want you to think about that today. And I want you to think about what it is to bring glory to God. One of the great challenges we have and have had throughout all of church history is the um, separation of the sacred and the secular. And this is a real problem for many of us. Some of us think that work is just where we make money. Now, a bank robber can make money. A bank robber, in fact, can make a lot of money and then tithe his money to the church, I suppose. And if you're a bank robber here today, you can do that. Um, I'd encourage you to do that. But, but that says nothing about the character of the worker or how you get your money or whether your work really does, you know, it, if, if it is for the common good of others and glorifying the God. Well, clearly that's not. But I want you to think about your work because the problem we have is we've got, yes, there's heaven and, and, and then, you know, the, the, the eternal and temporal heaven and earth. There's, there's um, a difference between clergy and laity. We make these distinctions, and we've seen extremes in this throughout church history. We think of the monastics or the ascetics who say the way that we really get close to God is just remove yourself from work or life totally and don't be involved in life. Go, go hide out in a monastery somewhere, and there's moments and times where that's, that's, that's legit and helpful, I suppose, any of us, all of us, with Sabbath rest. And then we look at, say, in the third century, we have Constant, Constantine's um, state church, where it was basically you know, church and, and Christianity dominating everything. And is there somewhere in between all that where we can meld this thing of the, the sacred and the secular of, of our lives walking with Jesus every day and the work that we do every day. Your work matters to God. And so we're going to be looking at Colossians 3. You can go ahead and turn there if you'd like. I'm going to do some foundational work out of Genesis because what we have said is that the driving verse for this entire series of messages is Colossians 3.17. In fact, you see it on the screen And while you're turning there, I want you to look at the screen. Let's all say this together. This is really our proclamation, okay? Challenge to each other, Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Everything you do. And listen, for many of us, we better get this right because much of what you do is work. And students, I want you to think today about school. School is your work. And sorry, but that's going to start a week from tomorrow for most of us. All right. Now, many of you are back already in sports or band or whatever else. But uh, I want you to think about your work or college students who I know are here about to head back to school this week, probably starting about the same time. So when I say work, I want you to think school because that's your good work. Uh, Abraham Kuyper, who is a, a Dutch Reformed pastor back in the late 1800s into the 1900s. He was also, by the way, the the prime minister of the Netherlands at one point. Imagine a politician saying this. There is not one square inch in the whole domain of human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign, does not cry out, mine. Your work is his. Your workplace is his. That moment in your school, that place where you find yourself on a daily basis. That is his. And so we said last week, as we, t- we started in the home, we talked about the family. The driving truth that I want to get across here this month is this. Captured by his love. So it all starts with him. He's the initiator. Captured by Christ's love. We follow him every day in everything we say and everything we do. Imagine that. Everything we say. Every word and every single thing you do. Is that possible? I'm here to say that it is, or that should be our aspiration. That should be what we seek to do. That's what it means to follow Jesus every day. Now, here's the main point of the message today. Work is a God thing. You're going to see this. So it's a good thing that points people to him. Work is a God thing. So it's a good thing. And we can point people to him. Another way to say that is God created work and he created us for work, as we'll see. And we do so to the glory of God. That's another way of saying we point everyone to him. We bring glory to him. We need today to think about work, listen, as worship. 
Milton Friedman was the one who said, business is business is business. And some of you have a mindset that business is simply to make money. And the more money you make, the better it is. And I'll, I'll use my money well, for, for my purposes, but also for others. And I'll give generously. Work is so much more than that. And today we're going to really delve into that. Work is a God thing. It's a good thing. And I want you to think about how you can serve the Lord in your work. So Colossians chapter 3, uh, we looked uh, thir- really 17 on down through verse 21. Look at verse 22. And we'll have it on the screen there. I hope you bring your Bible uh, always as we, as we preach. So look at what God says. First, this starts off bond servants. Now, this is strange. I know immediately you're going, wow, okay, that's a leap. What, wait, what are we talking about? A bond servant in, in, in this time, in the first century, was, sure enough, an indentured servant. I read one historian said that about a third of all people in Rome during this time were, um, or in Colossae, in this area, were, were bond servants. It was a common thing. And so I'd like to say this, and this really is the point. Um, if you think your boss is a taskmaster, uh, then consider the fact. These are, these are slaves. I mean, often volunteer, uh, voluntary slaves, ultimately, they were, they were not as we think of slaves. They, were, they, they would actually gain uh, skills and, 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 and be able to do things that they could use the rest of their lives and often a very loving relationship between a boss, if you will, and a servant, a, a house servant. So I want you to be clear about that. But he, but he says this, uh, bond servants obey. We said last week the role of the children in the home is to parents. Obey. Okay, kids. And not as strong. Okay. Um, (laughs) Obey. And here's what he's saying. Bond servants obey in everything. There's that word again. Everything. Those who are your earthly masters. So I want you to think about, again, bosses, supervisors, those we work with and for. Not by way of eye service. This is another way of saying, not simply when they're watching. Like, oh, get busy. Here comes the boss, you know. I oh, better look really good and, and going to make sure that I sound good and work hard and want to show that I'm working when maybe other times I'm not. Not as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart. Okay, work heartily, fearing the Lord as, as unto the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily. There it is. As for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. There is a greater boss. There's another supervisor. You are serving the Lord Christ. Then he says, For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done. And there is no partiality. So this bond servant, indentured servant, you're to work as unto the Lord. So what we need, listen, first is a robust, biblical, Christ-centered theology of work. I wonder if you've ever thought about that. Or a theology of school, theology of education, a theology a framework by which I'm a homemaker or a retailer or a banker, businesswoman, whatever it might be for you. So here's what we're going to do today. Break it down this way. Everyday Jesus in my work, I want to, I want to talk about, we're going to discover the purpose, all right? We're going, to deter, we're going to develop the practice and we're going to determine the prize, all right? So the why, the how, and really kind of the so what, what's the end game? So everyday Jesus in my work. First of all, discover the purpose of work. Why do we work? Now, in order to think biblically about every area of your life, and this is really my task and role as a pastor, help you think biblically, we've got to remember the grand, what's been called the meta narrative, the grand narrative of life. And it's this it's creation, it's fall, right? It's redemption, and then it's a new creation. And if you have those categories by which to look at every aspect and domain of your life, you'll come to understand what God is up to. And he's up to this in work. Now, in order to fully understand work, we've got to go all the way back. And here's how I want to develop a theology of work is to go back to Genesis. Now, you don't have to turn there unless you want to. But here's what we see. In the beginning, God created, right? So God is a worker. So work is good, first thing we see. And I want you to notice too, think about this, that um, does anybody know where the fall, so we have creation, then you have the fall. Where does the fall take place? Anybody know? In the Bible, what chapter? Genesis 3, exactly. You've got, you've got chapter 1 and 2, different takes on. One is kind of a run-through and then more detailed 
um, run at creation. And what we see, not until uh, Genesis 3 do we see the fall. Sin, sin enters, enters the world. And so before the fall, though, Adam and Eve, Adam is given work to do. Think about this. In a perfect world, we would have work to do. In fact, I could argue that in the new creation, we have work to do. Work is a good thing. Work is, is a God thing. So work is good. Secondly, God is a worker. We see this throughout, of course, all of creation. The Hebrew word for work can also be the word occupation. Uh, we, we talk about the word vocation. That's a biblical word, by the way. It means calling. That's a, that's a, that's a spiritual biblical word. And, and, and the Hebrew word for work or occupation is tied to religious work as well. Again, not a separation of sacred and secular, but all one and the same. God pronounces all of this as good. So work is good. God is a worker. We are workers. Think about it. We're created in the image of God. We are co-creators with him, finally. If we had time, we'd dive into all of this. But, but I wanted you to see just a basic theology of work. We're co-creators. Um, in, in chapter 2, verse 5, there's a little verse that says, And he, God, had no man to work the ground. Now, God, God created everything. He could work the ground. So he, he creates man for lots of reasons, you know, relationship with him. He, he, there's benefit to work. He wanted Adam to till the ground. And so work exists in a perfect environment. I want you to see that. Now, it's true that in, in, after the fall, our work becomes laborious, more difficult. Um, but there is work before the fall. You could say that man and work, we and work go together. Uh, like fish in water. You could say that work is our natural habitat. God places the man in a garden. Think about that. He places you in a place to do work. And again, students, he places you in a school. He places you in a classroom to do work for him. He places you on a team to do work on his behalf. And so work uh, and, and being human, back to when I was sensing it, even as a teenager, that work and being human go together. It's what it meant to be me and you. We have a job to do. So again, work is a God thing. It's a good thing that points people to him. Work is done to glorify God. However, here's what happens. Work gets corrupted through the fall, right? Work becomes, it's why it can become fruitless. It's why some of you are thinking, my work is pointless, or I wish I had more meaning in my work. Work can become idolatrous. We talk often about how work, your occupation, can become a preoccupation. And we've all seen uh, what, what happens in relationships and families when our occupation becomes a preoccupation, and we ultimately want to find our identity in our work. We make a good thing a best thing. And it's why we often say, after we learn someone's name at a party, at a social gathering, and what do you do? Tell me about your work, because we bring identity often to our work. So we all know the dangers, that work can be distorted, but that's true in every area of life. See, the gospel tells us that we have fallen, that we're sinful and separated from God. And so all of life is infect, infected, impacted by our sin. Our motivations get skewed and, and life becomes laborious and difficult and challenging. And Christ comes and he rescues us from our sin so that this new creation can take place in us. And then we become co-workers with God, bringing about a new creation in all the work we do. Last week I said, um, if you were here, we talked about the family. And I said the radical thing about marriage, about Christian marriage, is that it's not the greatest thing. And in a romanticized culture where it says human love, you know, between two people is the greatest thing. I mean, just follow our artists, you know, songwriters and, and movie makers. Um, it's the greatest thing on the planet. The Christian says, no, it's not. So to be single, I, I can glorify God. I don't need to be married because my ultimate identity is found in Christ. To be married, my ultimate identity is found in Christ. To be a worker Whatever that job is and how awesome your job might be or how much money you make, that's not your identity. It's found in Christ and in Him alone. Christ is the greatest thing, but God redeems our work. He redeems our ambition, 
And there's so much that I could talk about here as I've talked about this for a long time, for many years. Um, but I want us to really hone in on now the, the, to discover the purpose of work. And now let's talk about develop the practice of work. Your work, I'm going to say three things. Your work first is soulful. Now that's a, that's a strange word, but that's really what this, in verse 23, look where it says, with sincerity of heart or work heartily. is actually the word suke. Some of you might know that word. It's the word soul. Uh, now, we often think of, of some workers as, some work as soulful work. You know, we think of artists or musicians, maybe teachers or nurses, pastors. That's soulful work. Bring your heart to the work as if to imply that uh, business or attorney's work is soulless, without soul. Or um, maybe an engineer doesn't have soulful work to do, administrators. You cannot separate your soul from your life and your work. Last week, in fact, I was so touched. Um, she's here in this service, in fact. Uh, a woman came up to me uh, with her daughter after a service uh, in the sanctuary, and she came up and said, I want you to pray over me. I said, you bet. What's up? And she explained that she is establishing this new business. She's a an entrepreneur wants to start this work. And so she had some self-made uh, uh, business cards and she wants to, to serve others uh, in their homes. And, and she said, I just want you to pray over me because I'm starting this business and I want it to flourish and I want to glorify God in my work. I want to be a witness in my work. And so I prayed over her and I was so touched that she wanted to work with sincerity of heart, soulful work, do you bring your soul, your heart to your work and your heart filled with the love of Christ, spirit filled, you bring your work. Let me ask you, students, are you going to enter into the classroom soulfully, heartily with all that you have, bring your best to your work because your best will glorify God in all that you do. See, here's what happens. People see then there's a motivation. This is what Paul's saying. Beyond the boss, not for eye service only, not when he's watching, but instead you're serving God. You're not ultimately, listen students, you're not ultimately seeking to make an A for, this, for the teacher. It's a good thing. Teacher's an instrument of God in your life. Your boss is an instrument of God in your life. This is what he's saying. By his sovereign hand to teach you some things. But you're ultimately you're the one, I said it last week, God is the one watching you when you get out on the playing field. Jesus is the one that we're glorifying through our work. And praise be to God for his grace when we fall short. But we're serving him. So your work is soulful. Your work is hopeful. I want to spend a moment on this. There's two things. I know we have a lot of people who really who supervise other people. Um, some of us, we have CEOs and business owners. And you have people that work under you. And many of us don't. Uh, we're actually the ones who are serving others. All of us are serving someone, right? Uh, some of us need to remember. There's two things. Work exists to bring order to chaos, and, ex and it exists to serve others. You've got to think about how your work uh, exists to serve other people. That's the ultimate end as we work for the common good, we call it. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he wrote uh, the Babylonian captivity, and in it, he, and he did so much. There's so much he, he did that was radical stuff on the, um, you know, really not the, you know, the, the integration of faith and work. And he emphasized the dignity and sacred nature of all of work, regardless of what you do. And he, he writes this, the entire world is full of service to God. This was a radical thought. Not only in the churches, but also in the home, the kitchen, the cellar, the workshop, and the field of the townsfolk and farmers. What Luther did during the Reformation, he said that the work of, of the woman who milked cows is equal to the priest who serves in the church. This is why ultimately they wanted to kill him. That kind of stuff was radical in the church. We're going to talk about the Reformation uh, this fall as we enter into the 500th year, by the way, of the Protestant Reformation. So I want you to think deeply. How does your work serve others? Businesses exist for two reasons. Externally, the service we provide, and also internally. We're going to talk about that just a bit. Um, see, capital ultimately 
exists to do what the business is designed to do, and that is to serve. You take all that you know and all that you do to serve others. Now, there's lots of great stories here, but just indulge me for a moment as we think about this idea that our work is service. And I want to I give you some examples of this because, you know, what if instead of asking which decision will maximize my ROI, what if instead I was thinking, how can what I know and do serve other people? And I want you to think about this, gang. Your work, where you are, and some of us can lead from the bottom up. Social good should be a part of your business model. As believers, there should be some intentionality here. The driver is not solely you know, shareholder value or profit. Instead, how can we care for others? Sony's mission statement, I love this, is to inspire and fulfill your curiosity. That's why they exist. I love, um, many of you might have read about Hewlett Packard's, you know, the HP way, which is a core ideology, here it is, which includes a deep respect for the individual and a commitment to community responsibility for the advancement and welfare of humanity. In fact, they, they, they have this, um, this statement that drives everything that they do. Consider Johnson & Johnson. Part of their mission statement in the end is to alleviate pain and suffering. Wow. There you go. Have it that. Now, they, they, they developed a caring statement over a mission statement. And it's this. Caring for the world, one person at a time. And then all of us know about Chick-fil-A, right? God's chicken. We all know <laughs> about God's chicken. Inspired by God. Or they put crack in it or something, you know, that has us coming back. We can't get enough. But we know. How about this? Here's their mission statement. Do you know this? To glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that is entrusted to us. To have a positive influence on all who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. My pleasure, right? To serve. One of the great stories I read years ago, it comes out of uh, Jim Collins' landmark book, uh, Built to Last. And in it, it's, it's a, the subtitle, Successful Habits of Visionary Companies. And he, you know, he tells this story, some of y'all may have heard, years ago, a pharmaceutical researchers at uh, Merck, a pharmaceutical company, they figured out the cure for um, river blindness. Now, I won't go into great detail, but river blindness is a horrifying disease. People in Africa, the Middle East, in Central America and South America, along the Amazon, people get river blindness. It's, a, it's essentially a worm. I mean, it's a microscopic thing that gets into your system, and then it has babies. Ultimately, again, I could go into great detail, having read about this, but, I mean, it just gives you hives, and, and you, you itch, and, you, and ultimately, you end up blind. They discovered the cure for cancer, but they, I mean, for this, this disease, but they had, they had a problem. People with river blindness can't pay for the medication. So what were they to do? Their mission determined that they would do whatever it would take. They had an ethical decision. So the CEO and others, they decided that we're going to provide this medication in some way, somehow, we've got to figure this out, and at great cost. They developed a budget and I think how it worked in part was higher margins on certain medications that the Global West could pay for, and they would try and figure out a way to give this medication away for free. So what they did over time, by 2010, Merck had given away 2.5 billion tablets of what they called Mectazan, approximately $3.5 billion to 80 million people so that they could be cured of river blindness. They decided that their mission demanded that they do so. So, friends, listen, I want you to listen. The, the bottom line profit is not the point of your work. It's to serve others. People say, you know, ethical business is good business. Until it's not. What if the bottom line needs to be trumped by an ethical decision that you need to make in your work? And this, you know, extreme examples would be where you may have to leave a company because you feel like you're being called to do something that's unethical. And to name it and to say, I can't do this if, you, if it's demanded that you do so. Now, to communicate clearly and walk through that carefully, 
is a delicate process. But when your mission determines as a, as a believer that following Christ rules over everything else, it'll change the way you do work. I know a restaurateur who has used his skills and knowledge in so many ways. Actually, he was really the driving force behind a kitchen that now uh, cap and cafeteria that feeds hundreds of people every week down at Cornerstone Church. This restaurateur happens to now be the chairman of our deacons. I know an attorney who's sitting in this room who brought his legal knowledge and skill to help shut down a drug house in East Dallas. I know a franchise owner who leverages his influence with young employees to say, hey, if you want to join me for a Bible study um, to teach uh, young people in his company how to, how to follow Jesus every day. I could go on and on. I know a businesswoman who provides, uh, through her ministry and work, uh, health care for hundreds, uh, even thousands of immigrants and refugees in the Vickery area. Our work can be leveraged for the good of those around us. That's why we work. During VBS, gang, we had um, an effort to, to raise money for Last Well that Ryan, too, who's sitting right over here, um, helps lead and guide. They, their, their vision is to give water to every village, every person, essentially, and to share the gospel along the way in Liberia by, by the year 2020. Ryan just got back from a 20-day trip. Sarah told him to never do it again. But, um, but uh, that, that ministry, we decided at BBS that we'd raise money for, for that great ministry. And, uh, and so the kids got busy. Audrey Ha, who's uh, about a fifth grader or so, sixth grade maybe, she decided to go home and she, little entrepreneur, decided, I'm going to create a business. She put together a little lemonade stand with a couple of friends. And the next day they brought $80 to bring to the altar, as it were, to help children her age and younger have water on the other side of the globe. Our kids raised $4,500 that week and established almost, I think, two, two wells in two different villages for people who did not have clean water before. It can start young. It can start with any one of us. Our work then is soulful. Our work is hopeful. And finally, uh, here, our work is respectful. Justly, it's, it's fairly, he says. Supervisors are accountable. And in verse 1 of chapter 4, we're to show love and respect for all people. And friends, we are in great need of civility in our world today. If you didn't see what took place in Charlottesville yesterday or this weekend... It should shock every one of us. That stuff cannot be normalized in our nation. Because you see, when, when we, I mean, this white supremacist, any back to creation, to say that any group is more important than another group simply because of the color of their skin or even their nationality is contradictory to the gospel and antithetical to everything that Jesus has ever taught us. And the workplace is the per no, the home is the first place. The workplace is a great place to bring about love and respect for all people because we're so often in this organizational chart, right? Where people are under us or work under us or you're somewhere on the org chart. But supervisors, this is Paul's point in chapter 4, verse 1. You respect everybody. And often the workplace is, runs across ethnic, ethnic lines and racial lines. And it's there that we can love, extend grace to all people and show people what it is to love others, regardless of where they are in the org chart, what your job is or what the color of your skin is. We must push back this kind of darkness. And we can do it in the workplace. Well, finally, as we close here, determine the prize of work. The prize of work is not money. I've said it over and over again. The Christ follower, listen, mere financial success should bore you to death because of an explosive power of a greater affection. Christ himself. So in Colossians 3, 23, 24, whatever you do, sounds a lot like 317. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord. And he says, you are serving the Lord Christ. Remember that as you head into work. This week, students, as you go to work, 
or go to school, your work in the coming days. Colossians 3.17. Let's say it again together. You see it on the screen. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So work is a good thing. It's a, God, it's a God thing, so it's a good thing. And it points others to him. Now, here's how I want to close this. And we'll close the service ultimately in the end. But, you know, often when we send missionaries out uh, onto the field or someone says, I'm going into the ministry and we, we ordain them, we bring them through a process, we lay hands on them, send them out. Um, everybody kind of gathers around. Yes, go. You're doing the real work of God. I thought, how cool would it be today to commission all of us into our mission fields, a school, a classroom, uh, a workplace. Because, friend, listen, if you're a doctor, um, you are there to show everyone what a doctor would look like if a doctor had your position and your practice. If you're a teacher, you are not simply teaching kids. You are there to show everybody what Jesus would look like if he led your classroom. If you're an attorney, you're sitting in that desk or in, you know, fighting for that case in a way that would show everybody what Jesus would look like if he were the one doing that. And, and students, you're sitting in a desk coming up in a classroom to show everybody there what it would look like if Jesus was sitting in your desk. That's why he's placing you there. And so we have heard this verse before, perhaps two verses here in in Matthew 9, verse 37, 38, and then Jesus, he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There it is. Laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Friends, he's called you. He's called you to go into that place to serve him with all that you have, everything you say, and everything you do. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you've given us work. And we thank you that we can glorify you in our work. And I praise you, Lord, that you've called us out to be your witnesses, to be light in that place. Thank you uh, today. We're reminded work is a, is a God thing, so it's a good thing. And we can point others to you in our work. I pray for encouragement to come for everyone. I pray for a focused mind and heart this week. And I pray now for those who uh, do not perhaps know you. They've not received your grace. That you went to the cross for them. So that their sin could be forgiven. That their work, their lives, everything about them could be redeemed. Every failure, everything that they have done in the past can be forgiven and redeemed. And part of your story for them. God, I pray for those who don't know you today that they would just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Friend, if you've never received Christ, say, Lord, come into my heart. Give me your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your death on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. I surrender all that I am to you. So, Lord, now as we give you our lives, we surrender everything that we are. We surrender our work. We surrender our role as students, as homemakers. Whatever it is, we give it to you yet again. We are yours, instruments of your grace. We pray it in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.